Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Schisler. I'm a veterinary dermatologist here at Colorado State University Veterinary Teaching Hospital. Welcome to Facebook Live. This is my co-host Chavela. She's my Chihuahua from Larimer Humane Society. So I'm here today to answer some of your dermatology questions and also to talk about what we do here as dermatologists at CSU. So at CSU we treat dogs primarily, cats and horses and many different other species of animals that have skin problems. And we're also the expert in ear problems. And these are some of the most common problems that dogs and cats have. So that's probably why everyone out here had so many questions for us. So what I wanted to do is just start out explaining what we do here. We see patients from all over Colorado, all over the West, patients that have been sent to us from veterinarians. So we see some very difficult cases. And we see patients from Fort Collins who are coming to see um, a vet for the first time with this problem. So the most common stuff we see are dogs and cats with allergies. They have skin and ear problems. That's why we have this otoscope here. And we have all these tools that we use to look at the skin. And of all the things we see, we see allergies the very most. And of all the questions we got today, there were a lot of questions about itchy dogs. And that's very consistent with my life as a dermatologist. So I wanted to start out just sort of explaining um, how we diagnose allergies in pets, because that's one of the most common things people ask me. So the diagnosis of allergy is actually by means of ruling out other things, and it's typically an itchy dog or cat. Um, we do um, tests on the skin to rule out mites. We look at cells, we look for bacteria, we treat infections, but when it's all said and done, if that patient is allergic, we diagnose it by looking at them and, and observing what's going on. And one of the things I wanted to kind of bring, bring out to the fore for you all is the issue of allergy testing in dogs and cats. A lot of people want that, and we do that for certain reasons, but I wanted to caution you against some allergy tests that are out there that you can buy online. So although that's very well intentioned, a lot of those tests have been shown to be really inaccurate. So they might tell you your dog's allergic to chicken or weeds or whatever. So number one, we often find that's not consistent with our professional tests. And number two, if you take that information, it's really hard to do something with it. So I would caution you against that, encourage you to talk to your vet about your animal if you think they have allergies. And we will do a couple types of allergy tests here. Um, one of the things we'll do if we think a dog or cat might be food allergic is we'll make a very specific diet recommendation. And what we're trying to do is eliminate all the things they've ever eaten before in their diet and give them a very specific either home cooked or prescription diet that has nothing in it except for what we want to be there and they eat just that. And we do that quite a bit successfully and sometimes we find those patients are food allergic and that's great because then they don't need medication. But other times they're not and when they're not we know they're allergic to the environment we might do a test on their skin. We might clip a spot on their skin on the side. She's kind of small for this. And then we put allergen in their skin and we look to see if there's any reaction there. And then we can take that information of what they're allergic to environmentally and we can put all those allergens in a solution that we give by mouth or in, by injection. And that can actually teach their body to quit reacting to the allergen. And we call that immunotherapy. And that's really cool because if we have a dog or a cat that responds to immunotherapy, then they're not on any medication at all. Um, so that's the main reason why we do allergy testing. We can already determine that your patient is allergic and then from there we can do that allergy testing to formulate immunotherapy. So those are the most common things that people ask. The other thing that um, people ask about is, well, what food should I feed my dog when he's itchy? Well, some of these uh, itchy dogs 
don't even have food allergy. But the ones that do, um, it may take, like I said, that very specific diet trial for a couple months for us to see that improvement. And so there's a lot of temptation, you know, to go to the store and pick this food and that food and grain free. And there's a lot of dietary choices out there. But the problem is that the food may not necessarily be bad, but it, it's usually not the type of food that's really good to tell us if they're food allergic. So sometimes dogs will be on grain free diets and we'll see, do they have a grain allergy? Well, some food allergic dogs are allergic to dairy or soy, so the grain free diet won't even work. Um, or sometimes those over the counter foods are good foods, but they're made on equipment that makes other foods. So then you're trying to see if your dog's allergic to grain, but your food is still having some trace grains in there. So my recommendation would be for you to talk to your vet about that or, um, or give us a call or come see us so we can do one diet trial for eight weeks and know for sure. And if they get better when we do it the super strict correct way, um, then we'll know for sure. Otherwise, you might be buying dog, different dog foods for years and just not get to it. So I wanted to share that with you guys as well. So we have a few um, questions here from the audience um, ahead of time that I wanted to talk to you about. And I just wanna let you know, I'm here to give you um, some advice, some ideas of what's out there but this doesn't replace a relationship with a vet. I can't really diagnose things very well, you know, over the internet. So I'm gonna give you some information that you can discuss uh, with your veterinarian. So let's see. Can you read that, Chavetta? Let's see. Okay, so Destiny asks, what could be the reason that my seven-year-old chocolate lab is constantly licking her paws. She's been doing this for years and she'll lick them for hours. And she has no known allergies and her paws do not look irritated or red. So very good question, Destiny. This is a very common issue that dogs have with licking their feet. And let me preface this that um, normal dogs will lick their feet sometimes. Um, usually when they're at rest just for a little bit or after they've been outside. But we do become concerned when they're focused on it, as you said, for many hours. I think you bring up a really good point in that when you know dogs are licking their feet or there's a skin problem, that you should take a look and see what's going on. I think it's great that your dog lets you look at his feet, you know, and what I would like to tell you though is that there are some dogs with allergies that lick their feet and their skin looks totally normal. So the number one cause of dogs licking their feet, the bottoms of multiple feet, is actually allergy. And it can be food allergy or it can be pollen allergy, they like walk on it. Um, so I do see that sometimes. Allergic dogs and their skin looks fine. So I would recommend you have your vet check it out just to make sure there's no infections or anything else going on and maybe consider that there could be some allergies. Um, something that would happen less commonly, it might be a behavioral issue where this is something that they do when they're stressed or anxious. Usually when that happens, it's just one leg or one spot, um, but allergy is not the only reason. We have uh, many treatments for allergic dermatitis. I mentioned the immunotherapy, which takes some time to work. But there are medications we have when you have a very uncomfortable dog that can reduce their itch very quickly without as many side effects as steroids, which is often what was used in the past. So even in the last three or four years, we've gotten some new medications out there that you can talk to your vet about. So thank you for that question, Destiny. Um, I hope that that helps you. All right. The next question we got was from Robin. And Robin asks, um, we have a six-year-old dog and he always acts like his back is itchy. When we touch his back or scratch it, he, he's scratching and he's sensitive with it. And 
he gets grain-free food, he gets salmon oil um, on his diet, and he has no signs of dry skin or dandruff. So she said that her vet recommended giving him antihistamine tablets, but they do nothing for him. So um, it sounds like your vet is, uh, once again, the theme is allergies, it's spring, it's here, and it sounds like your vet's concerned that your dog has allergy, and gosh, I definitely see that when they're itchy on their back like that. And antihistamines are a good place to start. Um, they're affordable, um, they're very low side effect. The trade-off there is sometimes they don't work, okay? In fact, a lot of times they don't. So um, that's something that uh, doesn't surprise me. So it's a good thing to try, but it's not surprising that it may not have worked. Um, so first off, my recommendation would be to let your vet know that so they can check and see, you know, is there anything else um, that might be going on? And then um, the other part I would um, throw out there is that, yeah, he, he is on grain-free food, but there could still be a food allergy or he could have an allergy to dust mite or something in the environment that even though he's on grain-free food, um, he could have problems with that. So um, it still could be allergy. The salmon oil can be very good to keep the skin moist. It has omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. That's good for skin moisture. It's also good um, to reduce skin inflammation. Um, so that can be helpful, but sometimes when there's allergy, that's just not enough. So my guess is that it's allergy and they're on the right track. My recommendation is to get some follow-up and then decide based on how severe this is what you'd like to try next for that. Um, or if it's something where you know he's comfortable most of the time and he only itches a little bit when you tickle his back, then that might be, see she's doing that a little bit, that might be acceptable. So um, I think we ought to try something else for that possibly. Um, good question. Very common. We do have some questions coming in. Um, let's see if I can check it and find those questions. Thank you for asking questions. Oh boy, here's me. I might need some of, some of my assistance. All right, here we go. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron says, keep up the great work. All right, so um, what do I do about the white flakes on my cat's back? I've been asked, okay. Thank you, Kristen, for that question. Um, question is, well, what, what are causing the white flakes? Well, sometimes the white flakes are due to mites. Not often, but sometimes. So we can take that skin and, and do a scrape and look under the microscope, because if it's that, we can treat that. It's called chylotiella. We have it in Colorado. But sometimes with cats, um, they just don't groom as, as much as they could along their back. So we call that seborrhea, and that can either be dry or greasy. So if they're not too itchy, it might be that. And uh, brushing them more could help. Um, sometimes cats have a tendency to gain some weight, um, don't we all? Um, but they, <laughs> I do. Um, but then if they gain weight, they can't, they can't reach the spot on their back. And so if they can't reach the spot on their back, it gets really itchy. So um, we can work on that by, by grooming them. We look for mites, look for infection. We can groom them a little more there, get them some weight loss. And then there are products we can put on the skin that moisturize the skin. And these are products um, that aren't sticky and they absorb very nicely and they mimic normal skin oils. So that is um, when we have seborrhea, that's one way we, we treat that. So. Um, Hopefully that helps give you some ideas. Maybe we'll move on to Mo's question. So Mo asked, I have an eight-year-old female golden chow mixed breed dog, and um, this dog's had pancreatitis within the last two years. We monitor her fat intake but we used to give her sardines to keep her skin nice. It sounds like she has a poor 
uh, poor skin, poor coat. So the sardines helped her skin, and now, um, now Mo can't feed that anymore because it gives her stomach issues. So what should we do? Great question. Um, one of the things I love about working here and being a dermatologist is a lot of our patients, they're just like people. They have special multiple things going on. So something that works for Mo's dog may not work for Robin's dog, may not work for Chavela. Um, so the sardines, um, those are high in omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. So those moisturize the skin. Makes a lot of sense why that would help. Um, when dogs have pancreatitis, um, just for the rest of the audience, that is a very serious inflammation of the pancreas that can cause stomach upset. Sometimes dogs even need to be hospitalized for that. And high fat food can trigger it. So those sardines have fatty acids in them and it doesn't surprise me that unfortunately that's going to um, cause your dog some problems. And so in general, when dogs are on lower fat diets, sometimes their skin get dry. So, so when you say that she has poor skin, I'm assuming that means the skin is dry and otherwise fine. Um, I know it says you're gonna see your vet soon for some blood work, so have them, they will, but have them check out the skin. And if it's, if it's dry skin that's going on, then one thing we can do is instead of giving the oils by mouth, because your dog can't have that with the pancreatitis, there are some topicals that we can put on the skin that can retain that moisture. There's sprays and spot-ons and moisturizing shampoos that can help improve that coat instead of giving the oil internally, which would trigger the pancreatitis. So um, those are some hints there. And what you're, what you're saying brings up some good points, um, makes a lot of sense. So stay on that low fat diet, follow up with your vet on that. And, um, and maybe we can put something on the skin that'll help. And so it looks like I have some questions. Um, might need a little help uh, finding them from my, from my assistant. It's very strange to look at yourself live um, as it's going. So let's see here. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So the next question is, Apoquel is quite new here in Korea. So, hi, thank you for joining in from Korea. I love that, that's, a, that's amazing. I love to visit Korea and lecture in Korea. And so Apoquel, you guys, it is an allergy medication that's been around for about three or four years consistently in the United States. I have a lot of um, experience with Apoquel. And so it came out in the United States and some European countries first, and now it's finally making its way to South America and it's finally making its way to Asia. So what can I tell you about Apoquel? Um, this is going to be more for a general audience rather than a veterinary audience. So if you're a veterinarian, just send me a private message. Um, so Apoquel is a pill. It's an allergy pill um, that's not a steroid. And um, so we used to use a lot of anti-inflammatory steroids because they work fast for itch. Um, and what's nice about this is that it doesn't have those side effects. Um, so it's a pill that we give for um, dogs with allergies that treats the symptoms, usually works in one to two uh, days, often within a day. And um, in my opinion, it's reasonable to give long terms with long term with some dogs that have allergy. Um, we just don't have dogs that have been on it for 10 or 15 years, so we just don't know. But my experience has been it's very well tolerated. It's a very good tool for treating allergies rapidly, reliably in dogs without um, short term side effects, and we don't have evidence for significant concerning long-term side effects. So, so I would say that, um, honestly, I use quite a bit of Apoquel for short-term and sometimes long-term in dogs. Um, with any new drug that's out there, guys, if you Google it, you'll find a lot of information. Um, some of that is, is very scary information. Um, some of that is very scientific information. Um, so I would just recommend if you're coming across information about a new drug that's scary to you that your vet recommended, go ahead and call them and say, hey, I read this. What can you tell me about that? 
um, because I like to have that dialogue and just and just like give you information about what's out there. Um, to be frank, I don't prescribe things that I wouldn't give to Chavella. Um, so for me personally, I feel good enough about Apoquel. If she was itchy, I would give it to Chavella. Maybe I would, yes, maybe I would do some, I would do a food trial. You know, I would, I would consider maybe doing some immunotherapy too, but gosh, if she got super itchy quick, um, I've got some good response. So I hope that helps out there. Um, that's one of those new allergy treatments um, that, we're, that we're pretty thankful for out there. Shall we move on to, to another question? Thank you for your question about Apoquel. Okay, um, so this question is from Lisa. Lisa says, we're at the end of our rope um, with our German Shepherd mix. He's constantly licking his leg and it's gotten infected and he's had five bandages put on it and it heals and then they, he licks it all over again. So right now he's living in his enormous cone. He's living in a big plastic cone and um, and now they're putting ointment on it. And, and what it sounds like is when they do these things, um, it's helping, um, but then he can't live outside of this cone and she's afraid it's gonna keep happening, Lisa. So thank you for that question. Um, I can kind of read the desperation here. Um, I like to have dogs uh, and cats in cone-free living situations. Um, so, there's a couple things I wanted to share here. Um, we do see dogs that, that lick their legs um, to the point where it becomes very serious. Um, and we do see dogs that when they're doing that have infection. So a lot of those dogs do have skin infection. The bigger piece of this that we wonder is what's causing this. So we can treat the infection, we can put the cone on, we can prevent the licking, but if the thing that's causing the licking is still there, then it's gonna, it's gonna come back. So that is the challenge, what we call a diagnostic challenge. That's our diagnostic challenge to figure out what's going on there. So I think you, know, you need to work with a veterinarian um, to, to really sort that out. Now, some dogs, when they lick over and over and over again, they get what we call an acral lick granuloma or acral lick dermatitis and it can be pretty serious i wanted to show you a picture of it uh, mainly just to let you know um, what some of our concerns are oh of course we've got an error message so all right it's live that's what happens so this is acral lick dermatitis it can look a lot of different ways i know that's pretty gross but I just want to show you guys um, if dogs are left to lick their legs sometimes they can really do some damage um, so I think it's very smart that you've got your dog in a cone but now we need to figure out why they're licking in the first place so we can prevent this from happening we see a lot of dogs licking their legs because they're allergic so we might find on their physical exam inflammation in other parts of their body like their ears or in their feet that would give us a clue to allergy. So sometimes allergy triggers it, they start licking, it makes a sore, and it's just this cycle, okay? Another potential thing that might cause it that we think about um, is arthritis or a pain or a nerve problem in their leg. So sometimes we'll do a very thorough exam and, and maybe even do x-rays depending on how they look because that could be why they're wanting to lick. Another possibility um, could be sometimes they're licking because there's a, there's a foreign body or there's a little tumor there. So sometimes we can identify those things. And lastly, but very importantly, um, some of these dogs, they have different behavioral reasons for doing this um, that's involved with stress or habits that they're forming. Um, so in order for us to figure this out, a lot of times we're doing some detective work in terms of um, doing a very thorough history, very thorough physical exam, and thinking about what factors are involved and treating and identifying those factors. In some of the really hard cases, like the ones up on the screen, 
sometimes there's two or three things going on. So I think it's great you're asking this now. I think we need to help you um, and with, have your vet or us help you figure out what's caused it in the first place so we can treat the infection but get them to stop licking. Um, so I wish I could give you a quick easy answer but there's definitely hope for this. Um, there's definitely hope for cone free living. Um, it may take some time, energy and effort but it, it's worth it. So, um, so that's my advice there. Uh, best of luck to you uh, with that. All right. Sounds like we've got some more questions. We might take one or two more questions in this session and then wrap it up. All right, let's see. Thank you for bringing this up. Oh, okay. Um, we got another question. It says, what does catnip actually do physiologically to cats? Fernando is asking that. I wish I knew. <laughs> I'm sure somebody knows. I think the first place I would look is I would look in, in some journals and, and read up what's going on. I, I don't know that for sure. I do know that I literally gave my cat catnip yesterday um, because it makes him relax and feel good. And other cats, it makes them really hyper. Um, but I'm very narrow as a dermatologist and catnip, I just, I just don't know. But um, I love that question. And now I'm gonna have to look it up and, and, and figure that one out. I think, I think that's all for the questions right now, guys. So I just wanted to, to thank you for being here, for asking these great and varied questions from all over the world. Um, I hope that the information that I've given you can help you start that conversation with your vet or um, you know, consider working with a dermatologist and talk to your vet about that. Again, we're here at CSU to help everybody. So we help veterinarians, uh, we teach vet students, and we like giving information. So we can give you some information if you contact us we just can't diagnose stuff over the phone. So that's what um, an appointment or working with your vet is all about. But um, I'm very, very happy to have answered your questions. Um, if, you would, uh, if you're in Fort Collins or Colorado Western area, and you'd like to make an appointment um, to CSU, you can give us a call, 970-297-5000. 970-297-5000. Talk to your vet about it. And um, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for being here. And Chavela says goodbye also.